So let's look at getting footage in in the first place. So on the media tab up the top here, I've got a list of all the hard drives that are on the computer. Inside of Resolve, if you come up to the words DaVinci Resolve, you can click on it and go to Preferences and you see you've got a variety of different preferences inside of the program. Now one thing you might want to do if you have a Blackmagic card is come to this thing that says Video I.O. and make sure the Blackmagic card is connected. I haven't got one plugged into this laptop so there isn't anything there. But if you have, come in here and make sure that you've got it set for Capture and Playback. Otherwise, you're not using the Blackmagic card. The other interesting thing you have here is this media storage thing. Now, in earlier versions of Resolve, the only drives that would pop up here are ones that were listed in the media storage. And you can see I've got the E drive and the P drive are both listed and the other ones aren't. But I can see the other ones, which is good. You didn't used to be able to. Certainly one thing that caught me a cropper as soon as I start using it, why on earth can't I even see my drives inside of it? Well, now you can, which is nice. You can still add them in here if you like. The one thing you've got to be careful about is make sure the very first one is a drive that's always in there and has got space. Resolve will cache some things on the hard drive and it puts it on the drive that's at the top there. Like at the moment, I've got a D drive in there. Well, the D drive on this happens to be a card in a card reader. When I take that card out, it won't be there anymore. And I'll come into Resolve and it'll pop up with the message saying unable to set cache folder or something like that. It'll be because the one at the top there is gone. It's disappeared or it's full. So make sure that the one at the top has got a bit of space. Add one in. Then you can bring everything else in through here. If I decided I wanted to add in my other drives, like the M drive is an external drive I've plugged in that's got lots of footage on it, then I can add that in, but it won't be added in properly until I come out of Resolve and start again. So if I save it at this point, you'll notice these two have got a usage figure on there. This one hasn't. This one won't have a usage figure and be listed as a media drive until I come out of Resolve and start again. OK, I want to get some footage in. So the way to do that is entirely through this section over here. Go to wherever your footage is. So on my M drive, I've got a demo folder and there's an awful lot of footage inside of it. And if I go into any of the folders, it'll pop up and you'll see clips. Well, that's not entirely true. You'll see clips if there are clips that Resolve likes. Now, to be honest, this is one of the biggest drawbacks I find of Resolve for editing. It doesn't like lots of types of clips. You can see this stuff here, these are MOV files, QuickTime files, and it likes those. These are clips that were filled on my Panasonic GH4. Now my GH4 can do MOV files and it can do MP4 files. It can do files which have uncompressed sound or it can do files with compressed sound. Now I know Resolve likes it if you do them as MOV files, but if you do them as MP4 files with uncompressed sound, it doesn't like them. Which is why I've switched my camera to do MOV files. You'll find it actually really likes QuickTime files because it was originally a Mac program and Blackmagic are really quite fond of Macs. But even then it doesn't like all QuickTime files. For example, it doesn't like DV QuickTime files. Now as it's a program developed for grading for broadcasters, it likes lots of broadcast formats. So you'd think it would like stuff like XDCAM. Now that folder there, let's have a look at this in Windows Explorer. I have a folder which inside of it's got a typical card based structure of some XD cam footage. And if I was in Premiere or Redis, I'd pointed at that folder and it would show me the clips. Well, Resolve doesn't. You have to actually navigate all the way down to the clips and then there you can see the footage. But at least it likes XD cam. Up here, I've got some footage which was on a Panasonic P2 camera. Again, if I go to the video folder, I can see the clips. But it hasn't got anything like the source browser, which brings it all in and does it properly. What about the DNG footage? Yep, DNG it loves. DNG is a format used by Blackmagic cameras and it really likes that stuff. So again, good program for that. Let's have a look at some of my other footage. Well, this lot here, this is some chroma key footage that was filmed in HDV. And I've clicked on that folder called transports and it's not showing me a thing. Well, let me pop back to Windows Explorer and go to exactly that same folder. And you can see there's tons of stuff inside of it. But Resolve isn't seeing it because Resolve doesn't like that kind of footage. It just doesn't do HDV. 
Go to some of my other folders. Canopus HQ, doesn't like that. In this folder here, I've got some HDV footage, doesn't like that. Oh, that's some AVCHD. So let's just double click on that and start playing it because it appears to like that, AVCHD. Okay, I'm getting a picture, but where's the sound? I'm not hearing a thing. What's the reason for that? It doesn't really like AVCHD. I mean, I'm quite lucky that some of this is even showing up because a lot of the time AVC doesn't show up at all. But even when it does show up, it never does the sound. So it doesn't really like AVC HD. It doesn't like HDV, it doesn't like DV. It doesn't like AVI files. There's only one real format of AVI file you can bring in, which is a Cineform format, which you're not gonna be making unless you go and download the Cineform codec and so on. So there's quite, actually quite a ton of stuff that you can't bring in here. And that's one of the problems with it. If you're going to edit with it, you're going to have to somehow convert your footage into a format that Resolve likes. And it's been like that for ages. We don't know if they're ever going to change it. This is the situation right now. So that's the first pain in the neck is getting the stuff in. You have to convert it. The footage I use all the time for training is a bit of footage like this, which is a conversation between myself and another guy at the office called Ringo. And you can see the AVCHD stuff it's bringing in there, but it's again not bringing in the sound, so that's no use whatsoever. So to get that into Resolve, I actually had to convert that into a different format. And I had to use another program to do it. I actually used a program called TMPEG, which is a fairly cheap conversion program. And I changed it into an AVID format. I made it into AVID QuickTime MOV files. And that works fine, and those clips are what I'll be using for the rest of this video. But in using TMPEG, I've lost all the timecode information, which is quite a biggie. You might want to keep timecode information. To get the stuff in, you've got to convert it some way, and if it's things like timecode, you've got to find a way of doing it. So the simplest way for me was to buy TMPEG, which was about 60 quid, and then I can convert domestic format stuff into something it would use. TMPEG doesn't really understand XDCAM, so maybe I'd have to use something else. I talked about using TMPEG. A lot of the time, if I want to do it, I'll probably convert the footage either in Adobe Media Encoder or in EDIUS, but then I'll have to have bought Adobe Media Encoder or EDIUS to be able to do that. Which is rather silly since I was trying to do this without buying an editing program. But yeah, it is a pain and how you convert it will kind of depend on what footage you're using. So another thing that might happen is you click on a folder and nothing appears to happen, but you get up a blue spinning wheel, meaning it's thinking about something. Because when you point Resolve at a folder, it will actually look at that folder and analyze everything inside of it and decide if there's anything it can bring up. But if you've got a big folder, that might take a bit of time. So you just have to let it do it. There are occasions when it's just plain crashed, but most of the time it's just taking a little bit of time before it pops up and shows me what's inside the folder. Now there's loads of other really nice things about the Media tab. For example, for Avid users, it'll actually deal with the kind of clips that you get in an Avid Media folder. A lot of programs don't deal with Avid MXF files. Resolve deals with them straight away. So you can just point it at an Avid Media folder and bring clips in like that. And if you do so, it'll bring in timecode, it'll bring in real names and all sorts of stuff. Now I've pointed it at a folder there. You know, that long name there, that's how Avid names it. But this happens to be a clip that's about an hour long and maybe I want to split it up. It's an old clip with some footage that I filmed many, many years ago and I want to split it up because it's not already split up. There's a really nice tool for doing that kind of thing. So what you do is in the media tab, you select the clip, you right click on it and you say scene cut detection. And what that does is it brings up this window where you can click on this thing, auto scene cut, and it'll go through the clip and it'll look for times when the picture's changed radically. So obviously the camera stopped and it started again. It's analyzing it, it'll get stuff wrong, it'll go completely doodle alley if your camera's wobbling around all over the place because it detects lots of movement. But a lot of time it gets it right. So what it does is it goes through and looks at it and analyzes it, gets a whole bunch of places where it thinks that there were scene cuts and then you can go and have a look at them and decide whether they are or not. And the whole point of this is to take a clip and then go through it and then split it up into lots of subclips. Each green line is a time where it's detected a lot of movement, which it has assumed is a scene change. If I have a quick look at these here, you know, I can have a look at that one. And here we go from that to there. That is definitely a scene change. You're right there. That one, definitely a scene change. There's a little purple line in the middle because you see I've got some lines which go all the way to the top and I've got some lines which are a bit lower. This is because it's detected a lot of movement here, but it's not sure if that's a scene change. Well, I can tell it is, but the computer wasn't sure. 
So what I can do is I can take this purple line and I can move it downwards and then it'll make that a scene or if I move it towards the top, things have to have an awful lot of movement and it's not seen as a scene. The other thing you can do is if you actually say, no, that really is a cut, you can just add one of your own in. And it's a nice thing that it's got that I don't have in other programs. If I then say add to media pool, it bungs them into the project and I've got my original clip and lots of other clips to go with it. It's also got a clone tool. Now the idea of the clone tool is that you can say, right, take stuff in one particular folder and then copy it to another folder, which is quite nice. You've got a metadata tab, so if you go to a particular clip, there's lots of information that you can have attached to clips, and it's very good on metadata. And you've also got the option to capture stuff. Now, this only works with Blackmagic hardware, and it doesn't do things like DV and HDV, even if you've got a Firewire port. But if you're capturing through, say, a Blackmagic Intensity Pro 4K, you can use the capture here. You do have to get the settings right, which I might talk about in a second, but basically you can capture stuff. So let me go and grab some clips. I'm going to go to a folder which has got all my clips I'm going to use and just drag them into the project. Now you notice I'm dragging them in there and the first thing it's saying is, oh look, they've got a different frame rate to the current project. Do you want to change it? My clips are 25 frames a second. It defaults to 24 frames a second. Now I could have changed it in advance, but that's fine. I'm just going to drop it in and let it change it now. It is important to get that right, because if you start off a 24 frames a second project, you can't change it to a 25 frames project. If you start a 50p one, you can't change it to 25. And Premiere is the only one that lets you change stuff like that. But Avid and Edius, if you're in a 25 frames a second project, you can change the size. So maybe you can make it 4K instead of HD or standard def instead of HD but you can't change the frame rate and resolve with the same. You get to the settings by coming down to this little cog here. So if I click on that, you can see I've got lots and lots of different settings and you can see there, oh, the frame rate of the project is 50 frames a second. I was saying these are 25 frames a second, they're wrong. And in fact, if I wanted to edit this at 25 frames a second, I'm gonna have to start a completely new project because it's gone to a 50 frames a second frame rate. There's this playback frame rate, so I can change it and play it 25 frames a second, but you really want to get this one right. That was based on the first one that I added in, and my clips were 50 frames a second, so it's 50, but if I really wanted it to be 25, then I would have to actually, at this point, start a new project. Now there's lots and lots of other stuff in here. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but there's some really nice options in here. There's stuff to do with the scaling, where you can choose how it scales stuff. It actually does very good scaling. So if you're going high def to standard def or whatever, it does a very good job of that. On the editing things, there's all sorts of defaults. Nice little thing here to do with slow motion. It's got three ways of doing slow motion. There's your standard repeating frames. There's frame blending. And there's also optical flow slow motion, which you don't find in every program. You can do that per clip. If you want every slow-mo to be optical flow, you can change it here. So there's nice little things like that. Obviously really good stuff to do with color because it is a grading program. Lots of stuff you could fiddle with. I'll only mention a couple as we go through this, but in particular, I mentioned the capture side of it. Well, if you're gonna capture stuff, you really need to come to this thing and decide what sort of video is coming in and what you're going to capture it as, which is this bit here. So where is it going to go? At the moment, it's going onto my E drive, which you remember was my very first drive in the media pool. Could go somewhere else. And what format's it going to be? It's defaulting to DPX, which is basically a bunch of 10-bit stills. And that's going to take up an awful lot of space. Uh, my hard drive would not cope with it for Toffee. So I'd have to come in here and change it to something else. You notice the only options I've got are DPX or QuickTime. So let's go to QuickTime. And out of the codex, I've only got some Avid codex or uncompressed. So very limited compared to other programs. There's also other stuff down here. Again, won't go through all of those, apart from maybe the auto save. Once I've made a project, I'd come into here, so click on the cog, go to auto save, and turn auto save on. Now, it's not letting me do it because I have never saved this project. You know, I started a new one, but I've never saved it. So the first thing I've got to do is save it, then go to the settings, auto save, and turn it on. And then you decide what the interval is going to be. The autosave interrupts everything, so it is sort of annoying. Even if it's a small project, it'll only take a couple of seconds, but it still will pop up at the most annoying intervals. So 
obviously the, the longer the interval is the less annoying it's going to be but of course if the thing crashes you'll lose stuff so i'm tending to leave it on 10 minutes myself and just put up with it being slightly annoying final thing might be worth mentioning is keyboard mapping you can come to that and then you can choose to use premiere shortcuts or avid shortcuts or final cut pro shortcuts Personally, I'm trying to remember the Resolve ones because they are different to most other programs. But if you're really used to Premiere, you can change them so they're roughly the same as Premiere. So there's loads of settings in there. and I'm not going to go through all of them because it would take forever. I might come back to one when we talk about rendering. Right. So anyway, I brought some stuff in. In here, I can do things like bring in bins. I can take a bunch of clips and put them into bins. I've got different types of bins as well. So you've got your regular bins and you know, I can just click on that and rename that. Pretty much the same as it is in every editing program, you know, you can tick on that and name it. You've got different ways of showing the clip, so you can show it as a bunch of thumbnails or you can show it in a list view. Different columns that you can get up, so right click on the column header and you can choose the columns that you're bringing up and so on. One thing I have noticed come up an awful lot with Resolve is people want to go to the name and change it. So what's that click? Double click on it to play it and there you are, you can see that's the wide shot. Well, let's call it wide shot. So the obvious thing you'd expect to do in every program is right click on it and choose rename. Oh, uh, well, there's rename. Uh, that's great. Uh, how about click on it and rename? Yep, none of that works. And the reason for that is that's the actual file name. So I can't change it. If I went back into Windows, maybe I could change it, but I can't change the file name. What I can do is I can bring up another column. So let's gonna right click on the column headings here. And I'm going to choose this one, display name. And there you can see I've got another name, display name. And I can just click on that and rename it. Now, to be honest, that's basically the same as every editing program, except you never see this one. You only ever see that one. Everything in every other editing program goes to that. I'm going to turn off file name because I don't need to see it. And I'm going to take display name and put it at the start. This one, what's that? That's uh, Ringo. No, I can go through this lot and name them. Obviously, I can put it into icon mode and I can see it that way. You can also do what's typical sort of Premiere hover scrubbing as you drag across the clip there. You can make the icons bigger so you can see them a bit better. And also there's the metadata panel where you can add in stuff, other information if you want to. On the bin side, like I say, you can put in as many bins as you like. There are also other types of bins and one of them is a thing called smart bins, which is basically a search bin. So, you know, you can set it up so it'll show you a bin of every clip with certain words inside of it. One thing I do like to do is come to the settings here and then go to the general options. And I like to tick this thing down here, create smart bin for timelines. So what I've done is actually made me a smart bin. And every time I make up a timeline here, no matter where it is, whatever bin it's in, it'll actually be in this one as well. It's like a search bin if you're used to Premiere or Radius, they've got the same kind of thing. So you've got a lot of that, very similar to other programs, apart from things like the display name and the limitations on what you can actually bring in.